Good evening and welcome to the Hydron module Ask and Learn session. So this evening we have Ed Davis as your presenter and myself Kyle Smith. So Hydron module is owned by Intertech and our products are made in Mitchell, South Dakota with our corporate headquarters in Greenville, Illinois. Intertech has been in business since 1996 and we sell throughout US and Canada. We sell to residential and commercial applications. So today, make the most out of this webinar. Take some notes. Then on the go to webinar tool panel, you'll see a spot where you can type in questions. Please feel free to type in questions at any point and we will be able to answer those at the end. Last, research and review. After the webinar, please feel free to join any of our websites or to take a look at our social pages to, uh, to do more research on geothermal and hydron module geothermal systems. Ed, why don't you take over from here? Well, thank you, Kyle, and good evening to you folks out there tonight. Uh, basically, we're looking at uh, on the screen that you can see is a, a geothermal unit, a package unit we'll call that which means it's a self-contained unit. It'll have the compressor, the blower, uh, possibly some electric resistance heat in there and associated ductwork that ties to it. And then you'll see a pump or a flow center is another term that we use, as well as associated loop field piping. In that illustration, it's a representing a vertical loop field. Today, we wanna to cover uh, geothermal in, in existing homes. Uh, can they put, be put in or are there any obstacles that we may see in the course of looking at a project? Over 40% of our residential geothermal installations are done in existing homes. We've seen that change in year to year. I mean, sometimes, some years that we do more in existing homes than we do in new construction. Well, that's a very good point, Kyle. And a few years ago, it wasn't too far off where there was hardly any new construction. So we did have to go down that road of finding applications where geothermal could be introduced into existing homes, uh, anywhere from older homes in the 50s to the 60s, even in the 70s and 80s. A lot of building has changed, the envelopes have changed, uh, building trades and constructions have changed as well. So, uh, a number of factors will affect the cost and performance of installing a geothermal system in your home. Uh, the size of a living area, uh, you'll always wanna have a licensed contractor come out and perform a manual J load calculation to uh, assess the size of the equipment. It's much like a blueprint on your home. You would wanna have that before you built your home. Well, likewise, you'd wanna have this to uh, assist in the size of the unit. That would be necessary to keep you comfortable. Existing ductwork. This is a big one, folks. So when you're out into a home and, and you're looking, uh, a duct system that was put in years ago may not be large enough to augment a full-blown uh, geothermal unit today. The electrical capacity, a lot of times we'll see uh, people that will actually take out a gas furnace or an old boiler or things like that and go ahead and install a, a full geothermal system, which will take a little bit more electricity, but in turn, it will not use any gas. Insulation and weatherization. Kyle, that is a big one, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we sell just as much uh, insulation and weatherization as we do geothermal because it's so important. Absolutely. We do want the house as tight as we can possibly get it, uh, therefore reducing the size of the equipment, re reducing the energy bills, as well as the overall dollar amount that it would cost to put in the unit. Uh, a sp available space for ground loops, uh, that could be any myriad of uh, applications, as you'll see in the upcoming slides. Uh, Kyle, you want to touch on that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and on the last slide, before we move on, I do want to say that that duct work and electrical use, it, it always can be upgraded and our contractors can always find uh, ways to improve the home and be able to adapt. So those are just some things to consider. So um, moving on here to the pond loop. A pond loop doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be in a pond. It can be in a, in a large lake. It could be in a river. It could be in a stream. Um, it can be in, in many different areas. Um, but with a pond, in this case, we need about 15 foot for about a half acre. And the more, the better. Um, 
Pond loops are very easy to install for the most part as far as costs go. Um, so if you've got a body of water by your house or your facility, use it. Kyle, we should touch on that pond loop application just for a moment. It could be a pond that you're constructing at your residence. Maybe you have some additional land. Typically, we won't find a, a pond too much in a residential area, but it could be a, a pond that has water in it or one that you are building. Yeah, absolutely. So if you are building a pond, please put the piping in the in the bay, you know way down in the uh, underside of the pond, and uh, you'll be tickled to death. Yeah, that's where you get a lot of efficiency because we get that water to water conductivity. I've seen dealers even put them in the deep lakes of northern Idaho and uh, even in the rivers of the Midwest. On the horizontal loops, Kyle, that we'll touch on next year, uh, that's where we'll need the, probably the largest amount of property available. Uh, typically, we'll go down six to eight foot, depending on your area where you live, and we'll typically run out maybe 250 to 300 feet, uh, one per ton of energy, and then typically about 10 foot apart. Now, there's many applications and variations, folks. That, that was just some strict, uh, basically, guidelines if you want to do that horizontal unit here. But there's many other ways to do it. Uh, Kyle, what do you think as far as directional bore? You can do chain trencher. Uh, there, there's so many different patterns of horizontal looping itself. So what, with horizontal, there's plenty of competition. So there's lots of different people or companies, rather, contractors that can help put that loop in for your heating and cooling contractor. Now, vertical loops, that's... I think uh, to date, our most popular loop style, um, just because of the homes that we've put into in subdivisions or tight metro areas, um, a vertical loop can really be put in just about anywhere with a very, very small 10 by 20 or 10 by 10 area and a city block could even be put in. That's exactly right, Kyle. And on that vertical loop application, we typically look to go 150 to 200 feet deep, one per ton again. And those could be put in a straight line. They could be put in a square. Uh, they could be ran down your driveway on the edge of it, uh, just uh, in the backyard. Uh, that's your best one as far as if you just have a, a limited amount of acreage or space available to put that in. Uh, along with one other thing that we'd like to touch on, Kyle and I, this evening is the uh, directional boring. That's becoming very, very uh, prevalent now where they can actually bring in the piping, completely go underneath your driveway if necessary, any concrete, any structures and come right up in your basement with the uh, piping, uh, the header piping we'll call that to uh, make a wonderful installation with not a whole lot of disruption. Yeah, we don't have an illustration of that here, but uh, those are the same rigs that you see maybe on the side of the road that drill underneath roads or uh, any other type of device, but they're pretty nifty uh, tools. And Kyle, in the next application here, we'll notice that uh, we have a package unit in, with a forced air system in the basement. Uh, but again, upstairs, you'll notice that there could be a possibility of uh, doing any type of radiant floor, a staple up, for instance. Uh, even in a basement, you could build that basement floor up to add radiant if necessary. And a lot of times in applications, though, with, uh, with radiant, though, we can't do that very often in retrofit applications. But nice part, though, about like a, the, any forced air system is that we can do mechanical zoning to where we can have the master bedroom or the bedrooms uh, isolated from the upstairs and the downstairs. So you could have three, five zones, however many uh, you would like that make your house comfortable. Yeah. And again, that slide with the radiant, again, that is on this on this slide here. It'll show it up up on the top floor. And again, that is a water to water unit in the basement. And that unit could also make chilled water if necessarily to run during your air conditioning mode with associated fan coils uh, with that application. In the United States, we ha we do have our dew points are so high here that we do have to cool by forced air. So we won't be able to use that tubing that's in the floor for uh, cooling. Again, dual fuel seems to be such a big hit, especially if you want to keep your natural gas or your propane, but augment it. Uh, use it as an augmentation device essentially and have geothermal as the primary source to heat and cool your home. But when necessary, we would use the gas furnace as possibly a third stage to finish the cycle if, uh, if you could that way. Uh, also, we didn't touch Kyle much on the, uh, the superheaters, but that's something also that we can have an assist on making hot water mm -hmm. uh, during the run cycle and either heating or cooling with the geothermal. Another big factor on energy savings.
Oh yeah. I mean, they, they make your uh, electric bills and your hot water bills. Absolutely nothing during the summer. Uh, well, dual fuel though. I mean, what a awesome subject because you can do a fireplace, you can do a, a gas range, a gas, hot water heaters. If you'd like, um, there's uh, gas outdoor heaters, uh, even a generator. Um, so having gas in the house is a more and more popular item. Very good point, Colin. Let's touch on the, the two geothermal units that we have that we consider a split system. One would be an outdoor split if we don't have any room at all in the house to put it. And then, of course, our indoor split, which could sit in the basement or in an adjacent closet. Yeah, so absolutely. Well, a split is basically the same thing as a package unit, but they are separated. So obviously that with a split, but uh, you can have them sit in indoor like we see here. And then with the outdoor that same box there that you see in between the furnace and the hot water uh, unit there actually will sit outside. So if you don't have m much room inside the house, the the geothermal heat pump section can actually sit outside and can even be covered up. It doesn't need any air source or uh, you can build a deck around it or do whatever you want. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Please take a few moments and ask us any questions that you have on that on the sidebar bar there. Um, or then you can visit hydromodule.com to use our savings calculator tool or to find a dealer in your local area. Ed and I would like it if you would call and talk to us, though, about uh, your home and our upcoming project. Contact us at 618-664-9010 or ask and learn at intertechgeo.com. Then this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website at hydromodule.com. While there, check out our future webinars. So let's uh, turn to some questions. Looks like we have a total of three at this point. Um, Ed, so Propane was extremely expensive last year. Can we add geo to our house and keep our household items that are fueled off of propane? That's a wonderful question, Kyle, and thank you for bringing that up this evening. With the propane, and again, as we had touched on earlier with the dual fuel system, it's fabulous because you've just cut your propane we're right down to almost nothing, and you're utilizing the gas furnace just during those really extreme periods of time. So what you have accomplished is now you have two stages of geothermal heating and uh, one or two stages, depending on the furnace that you have for heating, as well as two stages of cooling. And what we mean by the staging is uh, the compressors. Uh, first stage is typically 67% capacity, and then you bring on the additional uh, rest of the 33% as necessary when you get to second stage. So again, you do want the unit to run in low speed as much as necessary to give you longer run times and also make the uh, hot water necessary with the D superheater. Mm -hmm. I'd recommend burying that propane tank too, so that we don't have to look at it. All right, so here's the second question. How do I get the loops into my foundation? On a lot of existing homes that we're talking about this evening, uh, they'll bring a mini excavator in and they'll go down four to five feet and they'll core drill the foundation is one application. Or again, as we had mentioned earlier, we could do a directional boring and bring those right up into the equipment room and not penetrate the basement walls at all. Gotcha. So I do want to mention, too, though, whenever we do go through the side of the foundation, that we use hydraulic cement to fill in any uh, voids or what could possibly be leaks that could make and make your uh, structure solid again. Right? Absolutely. Those holes, they're those they're sealed up and you just don't get the leaks. All right, here's the third and last question. We don't have much storage in our house. How can we get geothermal? I think this goes back to that outdoor split question, that, or not question, but comment that we were talking about earlier. Basically, it could go in the exact same place that your current air conditioning unit sits in most applications. Uh, then we would just have to run new refrigerant lines. Uh, in many cases, you can keep the existing electrical line that's ran out to your uh, present day uh, air conditioner and you have everything you need right there you would still need the furnace in the basement or electric air handler or something like that but uh, yeah that's a it's a great idea Kyle 
Well, great. Well, Ed, thank you for your time. Um, and uh, everyone have a wonderful evening, and thank you very much for joining us.